Good morning, boys and girls in the audience. The time is now 9.32 and a quorum of the board is present. Uh, the State Board of Education meeting of June 2013 is hereby called to order. First item is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Is there a motion? Awesome. By Cassandra. Support. Second. Supported by John. By Lupe, actually. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. I'll we'll turn it over to Mertz. Uh, Craig Ruff, welcome as the new Governor's Education Advisor. We're, we're delighted to have you. He made a good choice. You're a good thinker, and uh, you even have a little wit to offer occasionally. I love wit. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps me going. It welcomes you going. Welcome, and Mertz, if you want to make introductions of the interest. Okay. To Superintendent Flanagan's immediate left, is John Austin. John Austin is the president of the board who resides in Ann Arbor. Cassandra Albrich is the board's vice president. She resides in Rochester Hills. Dan Varner, the board's secretary, resides in Detroit. Lupe Ramos Montini is from Grand Rapids. Next to her is Bobby Joel Kenyon. Bobby Joel serves this year as the Michigan Teacher of the Year. She is from Grand Rapids Public Schools, Ottawa Hills High School, where she's a math and science teacher. Across the table, you've already met Craig Ruff, the Governor's ed Education Advisor, and to his left is Eileen Weiser. She's a board member from Ann Arbor. Kathleen Strauss is next to her, board member from Detroit. Michelle Fecto is the board's NASB delegate. She's from Detroit. And next to me is Richard Ziley. He's from Dearborn. He's the board's treasurer. Thank you. I just, uh, as personal privilege, wanted to start the meeting that last night a few of us were able to get to Art Ellis's, uh, the funeral home for Art Ellis, a, a superintendent of public instruction here from 1995 to 2001. His funeral is this morning, but we wanted to represent him last night. It was a nice picture of him. Uh, and I thought I'd mention, you know, a lot of folks don't know, he was Central Michigan University's president prior to becoming the superintendent here. And we had a I had a nice conversation with his family, um, and I, I, I thought, I paid you a compliment as a board because I was taken back a little bit that they, there was some, you know, frustration with his time here, and, and I thought, you know, we're really lucky because we have a board now, apparently a little different then, but a board that I really admire working towards consensus. And, uh, you know, you, you're nominated by parties. That's an appropriate thing. It's in the Constitution. But I think it's just admirable when I hear some of the stories that uh, this board works so well together. And I, I certainly don't want to take it for granted. I appreciate it. I think John's leadership on trying to build consensus is, is very helpful. And, and it's not always going to be there, as we've seen. But, but back to Art, you know, he, he called me once in a while. I was superintendent at Wayne ISD at the time, and I was prop he called me the closest colleague because we actually had an operation that was much larger than the department. I had three times as many employees as the department had for an ISD. So welcome them to the uh, dissolution discussion. <laughs> uh, they've got some troops on the f in the field there that can take care of that. And uh, he would call once in a while because I, I've learned this, obviously, in the eight years I've been here. There, there really isn't a counterpart in, in the state, and it is a unique job um, in the sense that you, you obviously uh, report to a state board as appropriate. You've got some responsibilities to a governor because you're the head of a department that the governor uh, has a big impact on, uh, certainly through the budget and other things, and that's appropriate. Um, and I, I really, one thing I admired among other with art was that, you know, it's easy, frankly, from this job, you can run to other jobs that make a lot of money. And some of my predecessors have been able to do that. And some have gone to media and, you know, are good commentators. Uh, but I thought it was kind of interesting that he just faded, you know, into the, what's the phraseology, and decided that he was going to. Now, he started the job older than I am now. And he used to talk about his grandkids all the time, and I know I, I do that maybe to a fault, but because some folks are in the audience where my daughter teaches, actually, I thought I would at least show you my updated picture since Art was doing granddad things in, those, in that era, and I was just a kid. Now I'm going to just show this one quickly. This is going to be the updated official photo for the 
State Superintendent. <laughs> that's Krista's, Tom, that's, you asked me earlier, that's Krista's uh, new baby, Landon. He's in the middle. And uh, our son, Brian, and Mike have the other three split between them. And uh, it really, for uh, one, another thing I admire about the board is that this is a student-focused board. And it's hard to do when there's so many pressures from constituents that have legitimate issues that want to be considered also. But I, I really admire that it comes back to students. And for me, it, it's kind of reminding at this stage in my life that I want a place that these kids who are going to go to public schools here in Michigan, you know, have a place that they can succeed in. And, and I would just end uh, by saying I think I've said this a number of times, but I, it kind of helps me think about the 4,000 schools in Michigan, that if there's a school in Michigan that I wouldn't send one of my grandkids to, we shouldn't send anyone to. And that can kind of be at least our measure in the department every day about are there some of those and what can we do to help them get to a place where we'd be proud to send our own kids and grandkids. And I, another thing I just called your attention, the Achievement Gap Summit this week, just outstanding. I, I can't thank Deb Clemens. Where are you, Deb? Would you stand up, please? Deb, Bev Brown, would you? Great, great work. I just want to acknowledge that if you'd help me with it. I, <laughs> and Kath, thanks for your ability to make that. And I, one thing I noticed, often I'll go to a parking lot after an event, and this probably happens to you as board members, and then you hear the real story. You know, I, I'll have folks come and visit me in my role as state soup, and they don't know that I can watch them when they're in the parking lot. Probably shouldn't give this away. So you can kind of see they, <laughs> they might have all been polite, and then in the parking lot, they're pointing at each other, or they're doing <laughs> body language. Well, I went into the parking lot after the summit, and some very key people who I admire, who would tell me if it was, if they were afraid this was for show, or this wasn't, a, oh, it just, Person after person said this was authentic, this is helpful, it's really going to help us make the difference in this state, and it took so much work uh, and effort on Deb and her team's part that I wanted to call to the board's attention. And then finally, just the uh, first time in 20 years I didn't make it to Mackinac this year because we were here fighting for the Common Core, and that went really well. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll be at the island next year. <laughs> no reason to do that again. Um, somewhat on a serious note, I, we're hopeful that that will get resolved uh, at the latest in September, but it is, it is difficult for those in the field that are, there's an image that teachers have the summer off. I can tell you from my daughter's point of view and most teachers, they don't have the summer off. Uh, the legislature maybe has the summer off, but they don't have the summer off. <clears throat> and what they're doing is getting ready for things like the Common Core. <clears throat> they're working hard, there's professional development, there's work going on in ISDs and in local districts, and I just want to call their attention. It's a little more difficult for them, to say the least, to not know what the target's going to be for sure, but I think they're all adapting as best they can, and uh, we've talked to leadership in the House and Senate and feel, you know, pretty confident that they'll get this resolved in, in September. Marty will have more on that later. Now, we normally don't do a consent agenda up front, but we do because this, ladies and gentlemen, is our favorite meeting of the year. It's, it's because the Teacher of the Year presentation, and, and uh, there's a little nostalgia because Bobby Joe will be moving on, and we loved uh, having her here at the table. She's just been a sensational uh, representative of 100,000 teachers in the state, and Gary will be that also. But the consent agenda is so that we can, we can act on the resolutions that we're going to pass for both of these fine folks and for those others that were runners-up in a very uh, intense competition with lots of people uh, involved. So, um, for consent agenda, is I'll entertain a motion. Move approval of the consent agenda. Approval Moved by John. It was supported by Kathleen. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. Thank you. And the first uh, duty here is really going to be uh, one that, with a little emotion, as I said, where Bobby Joe Kenyon, who's been just a tremendous teacher of the year, and I think it was particularly helpful to us because she comes from a school that has made an unbelievable improvement in a, in a difficult situation with kids who need their needs met in a, in a unique way and has really helped us think those things through. So 
Bobby's final meeting, and I, I, we all want to thank her, of course, uh, and we'll have an opportunity to do that in just a minute. But this is your chance for your final report, and uh, we wanted to move it up to the front of the meeting today. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's hard to believe it's been a year already. It went by so fast. A year ago, I was sitting in Gary's position, feeling completely overwhelmed, as I'm sure you are. But the overwhelming, um, it subsides, and then you just have your goal to get your message out and to talk to other teachers and other schools and to share the good things going on. First of all, I'd like to st um, thank um, Superintendent Flanagan and the State Board for allowing me to sit on the board. Uh, again, it's, it's a pretty rare thing. There's only a couple states that do it, and I felt very honored to be able to be here, to sit on the board, to share, and, and to present. And one thing I definitely tell everybody is everybody here has their heart in the right place, and that's for sure, and I, I can't mention that enough. Um, what a great board we have here, and it's an honor to be part, to be part of it. Um, first of all, congratulations to Gary, um, being named the 2013-2014 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Second, if you haven't had your first cry, you will. <laughs> You're about to embark on an awesome journey, marked by personal and professional growth. I know you'll represent the teachers well, as you have an opportunity to give your voice and to share your passion. Let your voice be heard, stand tall, and represent all that's good in education. A phrase I found that helped me over my year was, you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. I wish you a wonderful year, and I'll be there in any way I can to help. As you'll see in my video that I'm going to share with you, it's been an extraordinary year for me. And with a full teaching load on top of this, it, you definitely needed those supports. I have three people I'd like to mention first who have been a big support and have been there for me. My dad, first of all, who has been a complete inspiration to go into the teaching field. After 37 years of teaching, he had retired, um, but gave me a lifetime of learning to love both teaching and to love science. My sister, Sarah Jo, who has been with me every step of the journey, Though she lives in Kansas, it's been long distance, she's been right by my side. Thank goodness for technology. <laughs> I can't tell you enough how much she has been there for me. And she also deserves an extra special um, thank you because she has faithfully watched every board meeting. <laughs> and after talking to her, I think she actually enjoyed it. <laughs> she's not an educator. <laughs> and then there's Lance. You can please stand. <laughs> <laughs> they say behind every good man is a good woman. Well, I have to say the opposite is true. If anything can make this job a little easier, it's having that extra support of a significant other, and mine has rose to the occasion. From driving me 4,000 miles to Arizona and back because I don't like flying, to falling, <laughs> to falling asleep in the car waiting for me to finish talking to teachers after conferences. You've been there. He has been a constant support, my biggest cheerleader, and so patient. He even did most of the household chores for the entire year, including dusting and dishes. Oh. I'm wondering if I can get a second term down the road. <laughs> <laughs> and they do say, once a teacher of the year, always a teacher of the year, so. <laughs> but a heartfelt a heartfelt thank you to Lance, and I honestly couldn't have done this with you. So now I'd like to show you highlights from my year, and if you could watch, you will notice just how amazing, incredible um, experience I've had. And that good news has been kept a secret. And that's a secret that's hard to keep. 
principal's done a great job. I think others in this room, but very few people know it. In fact, I had to pretend I didn't know someone a moment ago in order to be able to pull this off. Because I'm here to tell you that out of 115,000 teachers in the state of Michigan, 115,000 teachers, the 2012-2013 Michigan Teacher of the Year is Ms. Bobby Joe Kenyon. Not only is this a huge achievement for her and for GRPS as a district, she says it's a success for all teachers in inner city schools. She's telling us she's proud to work every day with kids other people may write off. To me, this is where I feel that I'm most needed. I can make the biggest difference here, and I believe these kids need good teachers just as much as anybody else. And my big philosophy is to teach these kids as if they're in any school, as if they are all going to Harvard. You know, just to give them the same opportunity that everybody else would and to teach them because they deserve it. Kenny told us today she hopes that winning this Teacher of the Year Award honor will show people that there are great teachers in urban inner city school districts who want to stay here. I'm one of the lucky few that my whole life I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a teacher. She works hard. She works really, really hard to make sure her kids understand everything. She did the year because she just loves her job. And for me personally, she always put a smile on my face. I was always excited to go to that class. Like, it was my favorite class of the day. Ottawa Hills High School, an inner city school with 96% African American students, at risk, low income families, the type of school that needs a Bobby Joe. I feel a lot of times people write these students off. They can't do as much. They, none of their family went to college, so they probably won't. And that's totally not true. You have high expectations, they will meet those. We have really had a huge push in promoting college, like Fridays we wear college wear and just talking about college all the time and I can't begin to tell you how many students that I have that are their first generation going to college and it's so exciting. She makes learning fun and she built the class with excitement. She actually got to know you like on a one-on-one -on -one basis. In her classroom, lessons in character and leadership adorn the walls. And in the seats are excited students ready to learn. Hi, you're going to be following those directions, part one and part two, working with your partner. Bobby Joe has it all. Dedication, passion, unbridled enthusiasm, and a work ethic like not many have. Just ask her boyfriend of seven years. I always want people to know how hard she works. She'll never take a day off. I mean, never. She'll stay up till two or three in the morning every single night. You don't um, stay up till two or three in the morning for a job. Without a shadow of a doubt, Ms. Kenyon has to be one of the hardest working individuals uh, that I've known in the, in the business of education. She's following directions. She did her mRNA. She did her tRNA and the directions say to use your to use your stickies for your amino acids. You have to wake up each day and each day you wake up you are excited to go to your job. And I don't even think of it as a job for me. I, I never even think that I have a job, it's that I go and do what I love to do. And what? Peers helping each other improve, and that's what you need. You need to, to let them know it's not we're here, you're here. It's all of us are here, and we're all just helping to go higher and improve, and that's so important. And, and
stated, good teachers are born and made. Neither part of the process can be omitted. So we need to be intentional about our work. We need to coach, reflect with, and support other teachers to help them become better. I also encourage principals and other building leaders at school to continue to build capacity and recognize leadership in your school. Bring teachers out of their classroom and in to help them influence their other colleagues. Like my is to help new teachers and support them as the turnover rate as you can see with teachers and staying in teaching less than five years um, that teaching is now being heralded basically as a, a stop in between um, other types of careers and we need to get that back okay. and, and retain teachers yep. yeah. I want to work with with that as well okay um, Let the community know we have great teachers here. We make important positive connections with our students every day, spend countless hours planning quality lessons, and continuously improve upon our practice. We are able to help our students succeed. It's an honor to be among such hardworking and compassionate educators. This year, I've visited many other schools and districts, and I can tell you that we should be proud. Our district is moving in positive directions. And after speaking with other state teachers of the year, I came to realize how much we are on the forefront of innovation, instructional best practices, and technology integration. None of this would be possible without the relentless dedication of each and every one of you. Our passion shows because we believe in our students. We believe our children deserve a high quality education as much as any other child in our city or state. It isn't always easy, but we're not here for easy. We are here because this is where we know we are most needed and can make a difference, and every day we do. We have remarkable talent here, and I'm so proud to be among you and represent GRPS educators. May we move forward with renewed hope and energy for the future of our schools and district. Thank you. State Board and, and really all of us involved in education, we want to thank you. Um, it was particularly wonderful to have you, given where you teach and, and your passion for helping those who have furthest to travel uh, get there, uh, to have a, an educator from an urban school district on our board. Um, just as a year before, we had Paul Kabinski, uh, a career technical educator, uh, to help us understand how we continue to innovate and lead 
uh, you were so um, successful in representing uh, great educators that you swept into office last fall, Lupe Ramos Montaigne from Grand Rapids. <laughs> <laughs> Grand Rapids stuff is good. We got to get more of that. Um, but you know, we 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 honor you as the state as the teacher of the year to uh, honor all teachers and to turn you loose in in helping all teachers uh, improve their craft. But we really benefit most by having you here with us and providing uh, the perspective of those who are actually doing this incredibly hard, incredibly important work and to help guide us as we try to make good decisions about how to support it and your participation and your voice and always been heard, it's been helpful to us in, in shaping the, the agenda and policy direction for Michigan. So again, thank you so much for your service and I know it will continue and I'm glad you had such a terrific year. Thank, so, you. Right. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. Not off the hook yet. We have a meeting that's going to about seven tonight. <laughs> well, this is now takes us right to our our next opportunity, and that's to introduce the 2013-2014 Michigan Teacher of the Year and the state level finalists. Uh, on on May 23rd at North High School in Gross Point, uh, I was able to make a surprise announcement similar to what you saw in Bobby Joe's um, video, naming Mr. Gary. Abood, Jr., as the 2013-14 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Uh, I think it's great that he teaches at a school where he attended high school. I didn't know until that day, and it just was an emotional thing to see him talk to kids that he was one of not that long ago, if you look at him. He's a young man. <laughs> uh, I'd like to invite Linda forward to the table, who's going to walk us through this ceremony. Linda. Uh, you know the cutbacks a few years ago where we weren't we had retirement incentives and Gene used to lead us through this we weren't allowed to replace those positions in the retirement incentives and so Linda's graciously assumed that leadership on the program along with all of our other duties and uh, Linda please thank you Mike uh, first I would like to thank you for those comments but tell you that while I may have assumed those duties there are others who certainly <laughs> take the take the brunt of this work and so I'd like to thank Bruce Umstead and Anne Marie Smith if they stand. Bruce was out there, I don't know, but Anne Marie and Bruce have carried this work. <laughs> and without them, we would not be here today. Uh, we had over 200 applicants for the position of Teacher of the Year for this year, and it is the job of Anne Marie and Bruce to help us work our way through a system to narrow that down to 16 semi finalists and four finalists. Those four finalists are then invited here to the Department of Education for interviews. The interview panel this year consisted of a state board member, an education organization member, a former teacher of the year, and an MDE staff member. Uh, Mike talked a little bit about uh, the event that was held at Gross Point, and uh, I think we have a video that will um, introduce that. And so Mike's going to help us get through that part. <laughs> Mike's got a tie on today. <laughs> this fatherhood stuff's really. <laughs> so, the other thing I'd like to do today, by the way, is um, I'd also like to share some good news with you. Some of them that, frankly, I haven't seen here from pretty much everyone.
formally, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Gary Abood, who is a physics and science teacher, physics and chemistry teacher at North High School in Gross Point, who will now represent us as the 2013 14 Teacher of the Year. Thank you very much. Um, if I, if I could just, he's brought some people with him. Um, <laughs> I'd like to introduce the superintendent of Gross Point, uh, Dr. Thomas Harwood, and uh, the principal of North High School, Kate Murray, as well as his family, his wife Janice, his mom, his dad, and his in-laws. So if you all would like to... <laughs> Gary, would you like to share a few words with the board? I would, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone today for this opportunity. It's just a tremendous honor and a tremendous opportunity. I'd like to also thank my family who's been so gracious as to make the journey with me and both our superintendent and our principal in Gross Point who have taken the opportunity to be here today. I'm really looking forward to working with all of you and learning more about education beyond the four walls of the classroom. As I've talked with some people along the journey so far, one of the things that I'm hoping to do is to continue Bobby Joe's mission to share the great things that are happening in classrooms and make sure that others who view education through one lens have a wider view and perspective to see the great things that are going on in our state. So again, thank you very much and I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to take a minute to introduce um, our state finalists because we had three people who did a beautiful job of representing their regions and their areas. And um, in alphabetical order, it's uh, Miss Misty Balcomer. And if you'd like to stand. Um, <laughs> so she teaches social studies in grades five and six in Lawrence Elementary School in Lawrence, Michigan. And she's here with Gretchen Gendron, who is the principal of her building. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Todd Chapa, who teaches third grade at Lake Center Elementary in Cordridge Public Schools. Yeah. And finally, Mr. Michael Medvinsky, who teaches music at Oakwood Elementary in Brandon. <laughs> and he is joined today by his wife, Elizabeth, and the principal, Christy Spann. Mm -hmm. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank and introduce to you at this time Pam Harlan from Mimic Insurance. And Mimic is the group that uh, sponsors the Michigan Teacher of the Year by providing them with a, a car as well as a check for $1,000 for Gary's school. And for the <coughs> finalists, the semifinalists, your, um, your schools will also be receiving checks and presentations from Pam in the fall. So Pam, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. I believe now that there is a, uh, a resolution to be presented to Gary, and so uh, Mr. Flanagan and Mr. Austin, I'd invite you to join us. President Austin Great. is going to present that, and we'll ask Gary, other board on. members to. I think we're going down to the. Why don't you go, go down, down, down this way? Sandra. That would have been you know, kept it against you, I'm afraid. But uh, congratulations and congratulations to your school district and your family. So Thank you. And we're honored to have you here. So. Thank you very much. And on that note, I'd like to invite um, the superintendent and uh, the principal, Kate Murray, to join uh, Gary or Mrs. Black in the school. This is something that can be proudly displayed in the school itself because of the honor of having a teacher of the year and, and uh, I'd like to present that to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> 
you will. Yeah. <laughs> and then there you go. There's your. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I only have two hands. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, <coughs> this actually goes with that. This is a pin in the same form as the award. Um, and it, it comes with a little card that says, it takes a circle of love and support to mold young lives. And uh, since you're wearing such a nice suit, I'm not going <laughs> to put this on you, okay. but I will give it to you so that you can Thank wear you. it proudly. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, can we get one, one <laughs> picture here? Oh. Great, thanks. I already posted yours. Where did you post it? Sir? <coughs> I guess it's Under your name? Yes. <coughs> you go to mine and then you can, you can share. Okay. Hello, I'm Montini. I'm Lupe Ramos Montini. I, I spent my okay. Monday bucking. Okay. Okay. Oh, so uh, I'll give you my phone and then you can email them to you. Or, uh, we're gonna we just learned that word. Like yeah, can you? Up what do you need? My phone number or my? <laughs> yeah. Phone number? You want Use my Father's Day gift. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Care of what was obstructing the family cottage. Okay. <laughs> it's the manly thing. How big a chainsaw is it? Fourteen inches in size does matter. <laughs> You weren't supposed to do this. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't. No, I'm good. Thank you. What? Mike, thank you for letting me have a party. Yeah. It's a wonderful time of the year, and we certainly enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for driving to DC. The bottom of the black, but that's all your question. No worries. I suddenly was looking at that, that like the base. Yeah. Yeah, that's just the base. Yeah. I figured that out after this. No worries. Just give a moment for benefits folks to escape. <coughs> John's tracking down old family members, I think. Greg, I know you're so modest, but you were actually allowed to come up and get pictures with the board. You're kind of an honorary ex officio, as wow. I am. 
don't know the role of an ex-officio. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like a notary public emeritus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Continue and Eileen, condolences on your mom's passing. She seemed like a great lady. Your your description uh, was of a very unique person. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, the first item in today's committee of the whole meeting is a presentation on the Office of Great Start report. And Susan and Jeremy are going to join us at the table. And kind of as a preview to this, this is an example of kind of as a department head when I take. You want to think about this way. Sometimes I actually have to take my state superintendent hat off and put a director hat on. And the director hat was one that we, frankly, made a pitch to the governor. So, Craig, uh, you, can, you can acknowledge that we're giving credit where credit is due because we thought this might have been headed to one of the other departments. And we thought it was more appropriate that early childhood and the Office of Great Start end up here at MDE. And uh, to a person here at, on the board, uh, and I think uh, Susan and I for sure have a long history all the way back to Ready to Learn on a Head Start, uh, I'm sorry, on Early Great Start, along with you, as a matter of fact, who were in some of those same initiatives. So we were really happy when Executive Order 2011-8 created the Office of Great Start within the Department of Education. I can't, I can't overstate how important I think that was and is and hope it continues that way. Uh, Great Start's charged with leading efforts to coordinate and integrate Michigan's investment in children from birth through age eight, and including prenatal. In this presentation, uh, Susan and Jeremy are going to share information from the Great Start report. By the way, these are two outstanding people. We're just lucky to have Susan and Jeremy. Uh, even if it hadn't been in the department, this would have been good for the state, but it really adds a lot when Susan as a deputy and Jeremy in his role really help us uh, organization-wide make some of the decisions that we have to make beyond Great Start. So with that in mind, uh, Susan, I'm going to pass it on to you. Thank you, Mike. It is an honor today to present to you the Great Start, Great Investment, Great Future Plan for Early Learning and Development in Michigan. Probably the kids' fingers say it all. This is good for kids, it's good for Michigan, it's good for all of us. Before Diving into the plan, I'd like to acknowledge a number of institutions and people. This truly was a collaborative plan, and it took all of these partners to come together to actually produce this plan and report. As you may remember, the legislature required us to do this report, and they did a nice thing. They said, do this report, but oh, by the way, you have to raise private funding to pay for this report. So fortunately, the Office of the Foundation Liaison worked very quickly to secure funding for this report from the Kresge Foundation. And so the Kresge Foundation paid for this entire report. I acknowledge Wendy Lewis Jackson, who was the program officer, who was the force behind this, and that this is a passion for her. And Quite frankly, without them, we wouldn't have been able to get to this point. The funding from Kresge allowed the department to work with two incredible institutions, public sector consultants and Citizens Research Council that did the bulk of the work in pulling together this report. I'd like to acknowledge Peter Pratt and Michelle Richard, who are sitting right here from public sector consultants, 
and Jeff Gilfoyle from Citizens Research Council. Then, if you're looking and you think about what early childhood is all about, it really spans a number of different services. Michigan Department of Community Health participated incredibly in the development of this plan. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge Brenda Fink and Alethea Carr. And Geraldine Lasher is here. Please stand up. Representing the Department of Community Health and Director Haven, who is 190% behind the work of this plan. Michigan Department of Human Services. I'd um, like to acknowledge Colin Parks, Steve Yeager, Dwayne Berger, and Cheryl Thompson. And Wendy Campo is here representing the department. Thank you, Wendy. And then MDE. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Jeremy Reuter, who probably could recite all 500 pages of this plan by heart. Um, he was the main point person in developing this plan and served as an interface with all of the departments and the consultants. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Lisa Brewer Walhaven and Lindy Bush, as well as other a cast of people within the Michigan Department of Education who worked on this plan. Then the Early Childhood Investment Corporation and Joan Blau contributed to this plan, and then stakeholders across Michigan. I'll talk about them in a minute. As I said, Public Act 200 of 2012 required the Michigan Department of Education Office of Great Start to complete four components. I'm talk, I'll first mention the performance metrics. There were outcomes that were um, identified for the Office of Great Start in the executive order. However, there were no measures. And so one of the tasks of this the report was to develop the performance metrics for measuring how we are improving our outcomes for children. Second component that was required <coughs> was a <coughs> financial analysis. And this was really looking at where is all the money in the state of Michigan for early childhood and identifying the different funding sources and how much was going to each of the different programs. Then the early childhood systems analysis. Early childhood is a vast variety of different services and it was identifying what are all of the services that are going on in the state of Michigan right now related to early childhood and how are they connected and how are they funded. Stakeholder inputs. Um, as I said, this plan really took a village to, to actually produce. Initially, we did 48 stakeholder interviews with policymakers, administrators, local service providers, and state and local advocates. Then we did three parent focus groups, one in Traverse City, one in Inkster, and one in Grand Rapids with parents, with children under age eight to really understand what parents are thinking about early childhood. And then we were going to do a, a pulling together of a small group of 15 stakeholders to actually come up with a report and recommendations. And we did a detour and decided that it would be much more effective if we really surveyed as many people as possible who were interested in early childhood and had them weigh in on what is it that we need to do to improve early childhood in Michigan. We had 1,300 online survey responses. Um, and that was educators, service providers, parents and guardians, policy makers, and administrators. And in all three groups, the stakeholder interviews, the parent focus groups, and the online surveys, we asked some basic questions. What is it that children need to be successful? What is working well? What isn't working well? And how do we improve access to services? And so all of the recommendations that are in this report, and I'm sure you've all memorized the entire report, um, are based on feedback information from the stakeholders, which numbers close to 1,400 individuals from the state of Michigan. Financial analysis. Part of the requirement was to do a catalog of all of the early childhood programs in the state of Michigan. At this point, 
There are 89 federal and state programs serving early childhood in the state of Michigan. The total annual investment in early childhood in the state of Michigan is $9.4 billion. And it's split almost evenly between state and federal funds. Total funding for children from birth through age 4 is $3.7 billion. Total funding for children ages 5 through 8, $5.7 billion. Let me talk a bit about those figures. The largest service funded for children birth to age 4 is Medicaid. The service or largest service funded for children birth through or birth, 5 through 8 is school aid. If you look at it and I'm sure you've always or some of you have seen me do the thing where I say this is brain development the highest goes here and then it just goes trickles down and I always say and I pray every day that I keep as much as I have because <laughs> there's not much going up anymore and our public investments are in inverse where they're the lowest here and then they go up well and actually looking at where our funding is in the state of Michigan um, we have an average of 8.8 .8 $8,800 um, per child birth through age 8 and 6500 per child from birth through age 4, 11500 per child for ages 5 through 8. So again, in thinking about where our investments make and produce the greatest gains for children as well as where we have the greatest payoff, um, our funding is not directed in the area that we would see the most return on investment. That being the analysis portion of the report, I get to move us into sort of the next steps. Where are we going from here? So Susan identified with the executive order we were charged with four outcomes, but no metrics to measure success. So first I'm going to walk us through the four outcomes and the measurements that we'll be using at the population level to identify success moving forward. I will preface this that uh, these uh, metrics were identified across agencies, the agencies that uh, Susan identified in the beginning. Uh, these are not the end-all, be-all metrics um, for all measurements for kids. Uh, when I get to the outcome, second outcome, for example, I can highlight the number of metric items that we had to pull back. These are sort of the top level, um, but we're going to be, of course, moving forward looking at all metrics that we can uh, to identify success. So outcome one is that to ensure that children are born healthy. First, we're looking at preterm births. We know that uh, children born prematurely are more at risk for infant mortality. There are other short-term health risks, but long-term there are cognitive delays, vision and hearing problems, chronic health and mental health issues that continue to persist. Uh, next, infant mortality. Uh, the most difficult thing that we can face is the death of a child, and looking at the numbers that are there, they're alarming. Uh, this is also an indicator of overall population health status across the state of Michigan. And then the third metric, African American infant mortality rate, is a, an example of the disparities that exist across populations in Michigan. The second outcome, children are healthy, thriving and developmentally on track from birth to third grade. This is where I'd like to highlight there are five metrics here, uh, but there are a number of others that were in consideration for this and will continue to monitor moving forward. Things to consider such as children experiencing homelessness, children with disabilities, um, obesity prevention, um, environmental health risks. Uh, the list here goes on and on uh, to ensure that children are healthy, thriving and developmentally on track. The metrics that are included are monitoring teen births. We know that um, young mothers are more likely to um, have low high school academic achievement and face possible dropout uh, with the birth of a young child, uh, face incarceration and potential unemployment moving forward, increased likelihood of health issues both for the, the mother as well as the child and consistent issues moving forward uh, related to those health issues. Maternal depression, uh, the depression that a mother may experience postpartum uh, has a direct effect on the well-being of a young child. Abuse and neglect, 
Uh, we know that children that experience um, abuse and neglect are at greater risk for injury and, again, death. Uh, they're more likely as they grow older to uh, participate in substance abuse, um, crime, particularly violent crimes, incarceration, and low academic achievement. Medical home. This is uh, a measurement to identify that children have a consistent, ongoing, accessible health care option that are available to them, not only for uh, well child visits, but anything that may come up through the course of a year to ensure that we're, we're helping to ensure that they're healthy, developmentally on track. Um, and then, of course, poverty, which is the biggie. Um, we know all of the, the indicators that go along with poverty, particularly low academic achievement, increased health, emotional health and behavioral issues that go along with it, environmental health issues, and this is per particularly um, concerning with generational poverty. Moving to outcome three, <clears throat> children are developmentally ready to succeed in school at the time of school entry. There are only two metrics that are identified here, but these are the metrics that will be helpful to identify success to the host of early learning system pieces that we're looking to put together moving forward. First being the participation in high quality early learning. So in Michigan we now have Great Start to Quality, which is our tiered quality rating improvement system, which is a way of both identifying the measures of quality in early learning settings, but also identifying where it is that we need to improve quality. We know high quality early learning experiences lead to improved outcomes. We'll now have a way to measure and identify where we need to have improvements and uh, maximize our, our investment in early learning. Kindergarten readiness. Uh, Department of Education is embarking on the development of a kindergarten entry assessment. This will allow us a data point to identify where children are when they enter into kindergarten, uh, how successful they are moving into, and be able to look back into the early childhood experiences. And I should put this in as a preface prior to going into any of the outcomes. In order to achieve all of these, these are not something that we can do as a single agency. We need to do across agencies. There are health indicators, early learning indicators, and uh, environmental indicators. So this is going to take a team effort across state government, local government, and of course those who are doing the hard work. We cannot achieve the outcomes here in outcome three or in outcome four, which I'll come to next. If we are not achieving, children are born healthy, they're healthy, thriving, and developmentally on track at kindergarten entry. And then lastly, children are prepared to succeed in fourth grade and beyond by reading proficiently at the end of third grade. So we'll identify a reading proficiency at the end of third grade. I think everyone is familiar with the uh, <coughs> moving into third grade, uh, learning to read so that we can read to learn moving forward. As Susan mentioned, we had over 1,400 responses to develop the recommendations moving forward. And so before I step into the recommendations themselves, there are some guiding principles that inform all decision making moving forward, including those recommendations. And these were informed by those stakeholders. First, children, children and families are our highest priority. Second, parents and communities must have a voice. This is a critical recommendation that parents are part of the design of the system and that we're meeting them where they need to be met in order to support their needs and supporting their children's needs. The third principle, children with the greatest needs must be served first. Fourth principle, quality matters. We know quality leads to outcomes. We want to take advantage of the opportunity to maximize quality that exists as well as support quality. Principle five is that we need to invest early. Principle six, Efficiencies must be identified and implemented, which means we're going to have to make some difficult decisions. <clears throat> Principle seven, we must implement the opportunities that we have to coordinate and collaborate in order to ensure that we have a system-wide approach to supporting families and young children. So I'll walk us through the six recommendations. Uh, they're ordered in particular. Um, <coughs> if we can't achieve the first recommendations, the following become even more difficult to achieve. The first is that we build leadership within the system. Leadership must be present at the highest levels to ensure that we're going to achieve these outcomes. That high level uh, leadership and support must start with the, the governor's office, the state superintendent, department directors, our legislature, and the state board of education. There's clarification in this leadership, the role that the Office of Great Start must play here at the Department of Education and with our partners in state government. 
the Office of Great Start has been charged with these four outcomes. And in order to achieve them, we have to work collaboratively with Department of Community Health, Department of Human Services, other state agencies, local partners, parents, providers, you name it. The Office of Great Start will be the, the voice for early childhood in Michigan and will work hand in hand with these decision makers to make this happen. The first recommendation in particular across agencies is to uh, create, take an existing deputy de director position within each department who will be a champion for early childhood and will coordinate with our deputy superintendent, Susan Broman, across agencies to be the policy voice, I shouldn't say policy, to be the early childhood voice for uh, the Office of Great Start and early childhood moving forward and making recommendations and decisions to support the early childhood system. That would connect back to the uh, state department's directors, the state superintendent, and ultimately back to uh, the people's group and governor's office. We must also look at our existing advisory structures in early childhood. There's a long list of advisory structures that support individual programs, approaches to broad focus areas, we must find a way to identify a single advisory structure that will support the early childhood system and office of Great Start that will include a parent, a strong parent voice to help inform the work moving forward, including local providers. Second recommendation is support parents' critical role. As I mentioned already, we can't move forward without having a parent having parents' voice in this system. So they need to be involved in the advisory structure, they need to be involved locally. We need to include their voice in designing the system and in implementing it. We must seek inputs from parents and how to meet their needs for information, for resources, and to support their decision making. And we must expand our strategies to meet parents where they are and support training and technical assistance to the programs who are working directly with parents. The third recommendation, again, we must assure quality and accountability. Particularly here, we must measure the effectiveness of our quality. We must identify when quality is not present and identify how we can raise the bar on quality or if the program or service is not being effective, we must consider if this investment is wise. We must seek, we must develop an early childhood, a coordinated early childhood data system. So the metrics that I, I covered to start with are population level data and they're very difficult to to, to pull back and identify particularly is this program, this program, or this service helping to move the needle. So we need a coordinated data system that will allow us to look at individual children, population, service areas to identify where we have success and also barriers to success. We must support quality. We can't simply expect quality. We need to identify um, measures that will show whether quality is being achieved and if it's not, what is it that's not happening in order to, to achieve that level of, of quality? We must make data-driven decisions. So we have a, a coordinated data system. We have data at our disposal. We must identify where our successes are, where improvements are needed, and where we need to make some other decisions. We must ensure coordination and collaboration. This is not uh, an endeavor that we can, can tackle individually. What's listed on the screen is this is not a single frame issue and cannot be tackled in silos. Together we must come together and create a system where there's communication, coordination, and true collaboration where decision making is being made in the best interest of Michigan's children and their families. Recommendation five. We must use funding efficiently to maximize outcomes. Susan's example of our investment compared to, to brain development um, and as well as the financial analysis, we have limited resources available at our disposal. And until new resources are made available, we must maximize what is at our disposal currently. And going back to quality and accountability, if something isn't working, we need to rethink it. Part of this uh, recommendation is is obviously funding quality that leads to outcomes. We must maximize opportunities to blend and braid funds. We must engage the foundation community. And there's a recommendation that will include engaging the financial directors within state government to think creatively about our financing for early childhood. Our last recommendation 
for me, anytime a report is done, I always feel like there's a recommendation of we need more money. <laughs> recommendation six is we need more money. But it's investing in what we know works and looking at what we know can work may, but may need to be rethought. So included in this recommendation is expanding high quality early learning experiences through preschool, Great Start Readiness Program, which we are successfully able to say that that expansion is moving forward as a first step. We must look at redesigning the child care subsidy system to support early learning uh, accessibility for low income families. We must expand and support early on early intervention, screening and assessment services for early identification, expansion of evidence-based medical home, um, expansion of home visitation services, expansion and building upon um, successful models such as pathways to Poten potential and uh, mental health services for, for um, mothers as well as for young children. And with that, that is um, <clears throat> great start, great investment, great future in a nutshell. Mike? Fantastic. Thanks so much. And I, I, I feel like I don't do this very well at the board table because we do it so much in-house. This was uh, an unbelievable effort. The partners in the audience, I'd like to just take a moment to give them a hand. I mean, this is something that couldn't happen yeah. without. Susan and Jeremy, the whole team here. It, it, it's a tremendous effort. I mean, and the good news is we got the Office of Head Start, er, of Great Start. The bad news is we got the Office of Great Start because <laughs> there is a condition that's going on in state government right now that I know the board's more than uh, active about in terms of funding. And we need resources across the board, targeted especially. But I think an example is when you're given a charge and not giving funding to do it, there's something, there's a disconnect. So the department's ordered to put a report together, but no funding to match it. I do want to thank Kresge and Wendy. I, I think we wouldn't have been able to pull this off without that funding. So thanks for that. And but I, I hope Craig, you can now that you're here, can carry that message back. We need the funding with this stuff to do the report next year. And um, I, well, let me just pause for a minute because I think this should be your your time. I can I can finish up. So board members, comments, questions, thoughts. Richard, please. Yeah. John. It strikes me that when, when results can't be measured, like kindergarten readiness, uh, then the only measure is activities. And this has been, uh, this has characterized uh, the last two generations of policy regarding early childhood development. We, we don't have a standardized test for young children, and standardized testing is notoriously unreliable and, and uh, for uh, uh, ages seven and under. Uh, so we, we're concerned for, for quality child care. We have no way of measuring it, so we end up measuring it. The only thing we can measure is what are you doing about it, and of course we're doing more and more activities. Now. I once had an experience with, every time it rained, I got water in the basement. And I talked to a specialist. And he said, well, you, you've got to put in French drains. We've got to dig up the floor and put in these drains and then have a special pump and it's going to cost you $20,000. And I was talking to another guy who kind of noticed that, you know, the house was on a, uh, on a hill and, and the runoff would head that direction. So he, he bought a spent twenty dollars on two two uh, four by sixes and put them in to divert the flow we had no more flooded basement when you talk to ex experts in early childhood they think in terms of formal programs outside the family rather than looking beginning with the child and, and proceeding with the child's needs and this is betrayed by the financial analysis that's cited in the study and, and we hear a lot of, you know, oh, the more money you invest in early childhood, the more returns there are. And it's, it's faulty economics because a mother who stays home and takes care of her children and foregoes 20,000 annual income is investing a whole lot more in those children than the government is. Furthermore, the results of this government investment have yet to be seen. 
District of Columbia invests about 12 to 14,000 per child on their child early childhood programs. And we've yet to see market results uh, from their uh, from their particular investment. So uh, I see a lot of quality in the study, but there are a few assumptions I think that we really need to take another look at um, because while early childhood programs are extremely important for certain children, I'm not convinced that, that they're absolutely necessary for everyone. Um, same medicine isn't necessarily what every child needs. But I, I again, I, I appreciate, I think on the whole, this makes good sense, but uh, there are some assumptions that I think need to be examined. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I have this toilet that you flush it and it doesn't really flush. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wanted, I want to thank you, Susan, and the whole team and your helpers, too, who I know well and uh, for great work and great strategy going forward. And um, I'll get to a question which is sort of the opposite concern of Richard's. But um, also, I mean, this has been a wonderful um, topic in which we have seen a real bipartisan coming together of um, uh, Democrats, Republicans uh, voting for additional resources even, and the governor's leadership and the business community's leadership. And I know that doesn't happen uh, on its own. So I want to thank everyone who's worked to forge that. And I also, I, I wasn't aware that um, the the Medicaid funding was still you know such a significant piece of the undergirding of financial support for early uh, for young people young children and their support so I hope that this could be in another thoughtful um, encouragement for those including the governor and others who are willing to support the Medicaid expansion how important it is if you care about the early years of our children it is a fundamental uh, contributor to that. So I, th I think that's important. I am really eager to get to the point where we have this, um, the kindergarten readiness assessment, because I'm really looking for a time when we can say, what kind of assessment tells us if the kids are ready to enter school? How are they doing at third grade? Are they on track? Uh, at eighth grade, are they, do they have the skills ready to move forward into high school? And then uh, are they, at some point during their high school career, mastering the skills that we're demanding uh, all students master so we can keep lining up and we could keep those targets in firm and in view. Um, so when, when were we likely to see the, the kindergarten readiness assessment emerge in some form that's out there? Why? The kindergarten entry assessment was just approved by the Department of Management and Budget and so it will be implemented in pilot sites this summer. Terrific. So that's a Thank you. Great. Kathleen, please, and then Eileen. Well, I want to thank you for this report. It, it, it seems like it's sort of not the culmination was going to start doing things from based on this, but I don't know how many years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, we had five task forces, what we needed for good education. We had one on quality teachers, one on quality principals, one on technology, one on integrating schools and communities, and one on early childhood. And that task force was chaired by Sharon Wise, and Marilyn was the staff person working with her. And we've been pushing for this for so long, it's great to see it. And when you talk about kindergarten readiness, I've been to kindergarten teachers, I've talked to kindergarten teachers and gone to their classrooms, and from what they tell me that some of the, these are in Detroit, some of these children come to school and some of them come with a lot of background and some come not knowing colors, not knowing letters or numbers, sometimes not even their real name. They have a nickname and they don't, when the teacher calls them with the name of this in the book, nobody responds because he doesn't know that's his name. Uh, it, there's such a difference, and I'm really directing this to Richard. I'm hearing. There's such a difference between children who come from homes where they're read to and done all the things that we thought would work, that just came naturally, probably don't come naturally to everybody. And 
we do need help to get those children ready for kindergarten. And kindergarten is so different now than teaching reading in kindergarten. That wasn't true five years ago, ten years ago. So things are different, and it, we just we know that the investment pays off. There have been all kinds of studies. The Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis did a great study on that a number of years ago and convinced a lot of business people in Minneapolis and Minnesota to support early childhood. So we're finally beginning to catch up a little bit, and this is really a good step forward. So thanks very much. I'll say a couple of things in response to what you said. Um, one of the things that we found in Michigan that was a pre-study to the formation of the Office of Great Start is that the survey of kindergarten teachers, one-third of kindergartners were coming to school not ready to learn. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, high, that's, one -third. that's huge. And unfortunately what happens often is they continue to stay behind. Can I mention, um, to Kathy's point, I, I, so many of us sitting here, you being a champion of this for so long, also folks in the audience that have been pushing for this for so long, I'm going to use this in the grad class, which I will go back to teaching when I'm done here. <laughs> I, I gave it up after 15 years. But there's a point in government that things get done, and how do they get done? And it's worth reflecting. And I think the way this got done, if I can be, is certainly the kind of the 15-year surge started to help. In this case, it took, I think, our team to help the governor's team, Geraldine in the room here at that time, understand that you can't get to third grade reading, in our view, without this investment. I think it was, it was masterfully done by partners in the audience that helped get that to a fuller audience. But I think the critical thing was for a governor to put it in his. We had a great, I thought, a great governor also as the, as the prior governor, Governor Granholm, who had the same exact kind of vision for this. But I'm going to start ticking off, at least in my head, to get ready for the grad course, but also maybe to help us reflect what is it that gets us to these end results, and, and where do you spend a lot of time and maybe not get results, and where do you spend time and it gets it. And it was, and I'm convinced it was that argument, especially when the governor co-owned with us the, the, with the board and with the department, the third grade reading metric, it was like bingo. So I mean, a little bit of that is just to mention in passing, and I, I, I think the board has done an outstanding job in keeping this on the, on the surface for so long, because if that didn't happen, you don't have kind of the groundwork for this to be lifted off. I think Eileen was next, then Michelle, then Dan. So, <clears throat> I want to thank everybody involved in the study because it is spectacular. And what I find really jarring in terms of data, um, I just wanted to ask some questions. It's not that you have to answer them. It's the summary because the, inf the amount of information you're able to give us is um, disturbing, uh, which I, I know that's why we have this report. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask is, uh, and there's three or four questions. You don't have to respond to all of them, but it, it is a, a matter of when you read this, finding it really jarring. About how much is um, in, within that $6,500 per child from birth through age four, about how much of that is, is Medicare? Right Medicaid? Now, Medicaid, excuse me. Um, uh, and I don't know, that, that's one question. And then I was curious because we have a very high percentage of, of uh, medical homes, um, uh, percentage of children aged birth to five receiving care that meets the criteria of a medical home. We have 63.5% um, of our homes in that category. And uh, obviously, as somebody who's from a middle class background, while I know children with diabetes and um, uh, severe food allergies and other, uh, you know, autism, I'm not sure what falls into that. But to have almost two thirds of our children be in that category, I wonder if you could address that. And um, everything that we put, everything that we have that's a, a quality program that addresses a child's need, child's need is a huge asset for the state. And I know that that's the way you're approaching this. But I wondered on, on child abuse and neglect, um, there's no comparable stats for that 19.1% uh, figure for the country. And I didn't know how, how we compare to other Great Lakes states or other uh, states who've been in recession. I don't know if that's extremely high or um, uh, similar to others. And I don't know if it can be mitigated at all through community services uh, whether, or whether there's a direct link to poverty on that. Poverty for us is, again, slightly higher above uh, statistical um, uh, probability. It, you know, it's four points higher. Um, 
I, uh, and I wonder whether the medical home situation is linked to not having Medicaid. I wonder if that's a part of the uh, situation or whether that's uh, 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 maternal health care. And then the last question really is a departmental issue, which is that um, the, in the outcomes, the NEEP reading proficiency level was 68%, but the NEEP reading level is uh, 31 And I thought that we had gone to higher cut scores for this academic year. NEEP would have been given the preceding school year in 2011, the winter of 2011. Uh, am, I, am I right on that? And then this would have been the fall. So we did, um, we reset our cut scores based on benchmarking to college, essentially college grades. And so we had, when we redid our cut scores, the math cut scores were approximately equivalent to the NAEP cut scores. Science was slightly higher and reading was slightly lower. Okay. Uh, it just seems like it's almost, it's double. So I just was curious as to how that, if we, we can have a discussion on that later. I'd be happy to explore it later. But are there any of those statistics that you can I'll share with the now? Medicaid. Mm -hmm. The Medicaid is $1.6 billion for kids 0 through 8, okay. 1.2, 0 through 4, and 0.4, 5 through 8. Okay, so that is weighted to early childhood, which <coughs> is somewhat heartening. And um, 1.2, okay. And then do you have any sense of where the rest of the services lie? Are they basically medical or are they educational? For, for the dollars that are spent. That's spread. That zero to four. It's spread across. Thanks. Could you repeat those numbers, those figures? The Medicaid was 1.6 billion for zero through eight. 1.2 of that was the zero through four. And point four was five through eight. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I think Michelle was next, oh. and then Dan, and then Richard. Yeah, I just have a just a quick comment. I, I really like the um, collaborative spirit and the bringing in the voices of um, parents and the community into this. I think that's um, incredibly wise, <laughs> and uh, um, I'm glad you took the effort to really to do that. Um, so I wanted to point that out. I um, I also, um, you know wanted to just acknowledge something that Richard said that yeah maybe it's not for everyone and it's not a compulsory program or something. so some people might choose to have their kids <coughs> stay home if they're lucky enough or circumstances make it they have a stay-at-home parent who's able to do that do you have plans to share this curriculum with people who are stay-at-home parents so that if they want to prepare their kids for kindergarten that would be an option or available well one <coughs> our current parent education activities <coughs> however and, and one of the interesting thing is that the stakeholders said one of the good things is that we're learning more and we're getting more information one of the bad things was we need even more and so part of the charge in all of this is how do we distribute information for parents in a way that parents can receive it regardless of the situation. And so that's, that. in my mind, that is one of the yeah, main tasks that we need to do. We have good information, but are we sharing it and is it accessible to all parents who want that information? And there was a pretty strong demand for more information to help us be better parents. Right. And as a relatively new grandparent, I'm, I, who keeps my mouth shut around <laughs> when the kids are over, I don't want to, but it's funny how information changes and people have different views and some's research based and probably I'm learning some new things that I could have understood I better. Last comment to, to just one, sure. I just want to also, um, to bring to life some of the conversation that people are talking about. My husband and I have taken in two more children. Um, anyway, <laughs> we're blessed, we're blessed. Um, and uh, one of them is a five-year-old. And it comes from a, a home um, where there's, you know, there's some some serious issues. And we have already a five-year-old with us, who, um, and the dis and the, the boy's as smart as a whip. The, the young man, the little one who just came to us, he's as smart as a whip. He's as smart as can be. 
but it is, it's the same circumstances. He doesn't know his letters. He can't spell his name. He finished kindergarten. He finished kindergarten. Um, he'll be going to first grade. Um, so we're, and compared to the little girl who's been with us who can write sentences and <laughs> at the end of kindergarten. And uh, it, so that I think, and, and, they're, and I think they're both equally intelligent. They're both very smart, but one just did not have the opportunity because of the circumstances um, to, uh, and, and he's, uh, he's, he's at such a disadvantage. And so we're working really hard. So part of me would like to also, <laughs> as a parent, um, trying to work to supplement his uh, education so he's ready for first grade, mm -hmm. have access to that information. So. That's a good point. We'll follow up with that. Could I just mention sure. that years ago we had these readiness kits that we gave to new parents, mm -hmm. new mothers, uh, to help them teach? Yeah. They're, they're still in existence. Jim, right? what, yeah, what happened to them? <laughs> We've distributed over 1.5 million kits to Michigan parents. However, just like you know, many things, uh, you know, there are priorities from year to year, and so the funding uh, discontinued um, on a state level, and the match then discontinued. So, um, what now is happening is that Great Start Readiness programs around the state are purchasing the kits. Oh. and still providing them and many of them are through home visits and a variety of other methods. They only get the kit when they're explained um, so someone walks through um, all the elements because you know you don't use what you don't understand or know so the more information we can give parents and and the whole goal of the kit is to really continue to increase uh, parents understanding of the importance of the early learning years and what they can do to help. Thank you Jan. Okay, thank Dan you. and then Richard. Um, I've got quite a few things, so I may go through maybe a few of them and then defer to others, and you can just keep cycling back <laughs> to me. I suspect I'll be, I'll be the last person. I think, to go I think well. you are the last two I've seen hands on. Anyway. All right. Well, then we'll let Richard go after I get halfway through the list and come back. <laughs> um, uh, so one is just really excited to see this. Um, uh, it's been a long time coming, and um, I, hopefully for all of us at this table and in the department as well as in the state, will kind of um, spark a new level of commitment, uh, real commitment to this work. Um, so thank you and to everybody for um, the work involved in putting this together. Um, in no particular order, uh, a few things. One is on the performance metrics, uh, just this is a really small thing. Um, but when possible, I think I would encourage you and all of us to frame them uh, positively, kind of in the same language as the goal as opposed to negatively. So preterm births, I'd love to see switched, if it, if it makes sense given the data, to full term pregnancies. Um, so that we're not kind of measuring the negative, we're measuring the positive just to help reinforce kind of positive things. When the numbers go up, they're almost, it's almost always a good thing. Um, small thing, um, but would love to see it. Two is, and this might be most important, I don't know, I haven't had time to really think about the relative kind of prioritization of, of the stuff on my list here, but Susan, I'm really struck by that uh, the inverse relationship between kind of rate of brain development and level of public investment. Um, I, and mirroring that with Richard's caution around compulsory, uh, so obviously the level of public investment increases when we get to kind, kind of compulsory participation requirements, but um, even if we're going to not make these early childhood investments compulsory, so to speak, um, and target them at the children most in need, which, by the way, I'm a he just so excited to see explicitly said um, in the document and committed to um, in public conversation for two reasons. Really, is the data points to the fact that the best outcomes um, really are tied to uh, kids that are growing up in families in poverty. Um, and secondly, because I just think from an equity perspective, it makes sense, right? Uh, in addition to the kind of uh, perspective that, that Richard brings. Um, but given that inverse relationship, I'm wondering what, I, I think I just want to challenge us. So this is the Department of Education, not the Department of Schools, right? Um, and so I really want to challenge, it's education, not schools. And if we think of education as being 
pretty heavily tied to brain development, I would think, I mean, just intuitively. I would want to see us as a board. I'd want to see the department. I'd want to see, like, all of us actually make early childhood education a priority conversation at this table in a way that I would argue it hasn't been. I would argue this is still at this table kind of a also, also we had a conversation about early childhood education, right? It was also whatever. And like, I mean, if this is the Department of Education, and this is not meant to be an indictment of, of you or your leadership, it's meant to be an indictment of all of us, myself included. Like, I think we just have to think a little more and, and hold ourselves a little more accountable for spending more time on this subject at this table. It's just that important. And given, I mean, the, the example that you just gave, Michelle, which is poignant, um, and frankly, if I spend too much time thinking about it, I will get emotional. Like, I, the burden that we place on our K-12 system in trying to catch up that child, right, who is so far behind, um, is astronomical. Uh, and the burden is financial, it's emotional, it's all of those things, and just doesn't, it's just bad policy. It doesn't make any sense that we wouldn't figure out a way to intervene much earlier um, in that child's life so that that catch-up game doesn't have to exist. So anyway, I, I just want to issue that challenge for all of us and hope that we'll take it up in the spirit um, in which it's offered, which is that um, I think it would just serve all of us well to spend more time on early childhood education at this table. Sorry, I got on my soapbox there, but important stuff. Um, all right, one more thing, and then I'll defer to Richard and then come back to, I think, what are my last four. Um, system leadership, this, the recommendation and priority around system leadership. I'm actually less concerned, this, this go, cuts against what I just said, but as concerned as I am about the relative lack of time that we spend on it at this table, um, I'm more concerned about alignment outside of the Department of Education than I am inside of it at this point, right? So it's, it's alignment with DHS. And not just that, it's alignment with, with vendors to whom the Office of Great Start makes grants to implement some of this work and so on. Are they really on board with everything that you're talking about? Um, uh, and I'm not sure, I mean, I've gone through the, the the grant criteria, and I'm just, I'm not sure how to do that really well, but I just want to place kind of that yellow flag in the ground around, or in this wet cement, that we've got to be much better at um, creating alignment outside of this, this department, um, if we're going to really move this work. And that's going to require champions not only in the department, but in other places as well, much like we have right now in the governor and other places, but uh, that's got to get figured out. Richard. Dan, could I respond to a couple of the things? The highest need, that came from stakeholders. We specifically asked, where should we be investing our resources? So out of the 1,400 people, that is the direction. So I'd say that's a really good sign that people are getting it. The other piece on, and it says invest early, but part of it is changing our culture in that we don't have a problem in education, health, human services, and paying for remediation. But we don't invest in early identification and prevention. And to me, that's the game changer in all of this. If we started front loading and really trying to identify problems and prevent problems, um, before they occurred or identify early enough and, and provide what I call adequate treatment or intervention, we would ultimately save a ton of money as well as the best thing to do for human beings. But that is not the way our financial system is oriented in most areas, whether it's education, whether it's um, health. I mean, if you think about how much money and health actually goes into prevention and early intervention versus treatment remediation as well as human services. I mean if you think about where our money is going and so to me that's a culture sh change and a policy change that is not necessarily requiring more money but it's thinking about how we work differently and from a 
and I always go back to the fact that I sat at Steelcase for 15 years, they had, they were preventing stuff because it cost them too much money to send out bad product. That is not the orientation with most of the stuff, health and human services. Grad, yes. grad course point number two related. It's because we have tension in the system. People who are starving for resources, so appropriately maybe, one could make an argument that a traditional K-12 lobbyist would be so thoughtful appropriately about more resources for K-12 at the expense of early childhood. That's been what we've been fighting for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I get the tension. I was a local superintendent, an intermediate superintendent, but I'm just saying there's a point of reality where if we can't get, I, I'm all for, when I put my state soup hat on, the pie has to get bigger. But when the pie isn't going to get bigger, you're just fooling yourself if you turn around and say, oh, we're all for early childhood, but by the way, um, leave us alone. Because then you're going to have learning disabled kids where that could have been taken care of with early intervention, to Susan's point. The costs are so unbelievable in the current K-12 system that could be saved if even K-12 people would be more thoughtful about that investment and not just the rhetoric around it. And it's one thing, I've run an association, so I can tell you this happens in some places, where there's a lip service rhetorical way, and then you send your lobbyist out to do something else. So that's grad school point number two. And I just, I, so it's more than cultural, it's strategic. Oh yeah. And uh, I think we need to do what Dan's saying, you know, the more we can kind of get some of those issues out on a table at a board meeting, I think is appropriate. I was only nodding a little bit because in the department, we're almost obsessed with the prevention and the early childhood, but I can see where that may not be as easily seen and we can maybe work that out in agenda planning on how we make that more of an issue. But that's a, that's a reality of what stops some of this. On the other hand, when I'm a local superintendent, of course you need more resources for your own work, so it's hard to say, geez, I'm, why can't we just have a new investment for that? That is the ideal. But there's a point when you say, well, whether that's going to happen or not, don't fight the $65 million that the center and all the rest have helped get us to that point where we're, we're going to, you know. It's a, it's, a, it's a, no malice, but it's a dissonance here a little bit. I think Richard was next, and then, and then Kathleen and, and Craig, and then back to, yeah. there are hands going up. Well, I resonated with uh, Dan's uh, kind of introducing, you know, the form versus function. You know, the form of the State Department of Education has traditionally been running schools, mm -hmm. running institutions. And, uh, Dan, you, you rightly call us back to the function that these schools are supposed to serve. Now, it's, it, that's the reason why I am particularly concerned uh, that we only invest in early childhood education that, that will be demonstrably effective. Um, the, the Perry study, which is based on only 128 kids, in 1965 has been used to justify the tremendous expenditure on Head Start. And apparently all that expenditure on Head Start has not brought the benefits that we are saying that new expenditures will, will bring. But I'm off on the, the thing I really wanted to talk about or ask about is um, I recall the Gazelle Institute um, had a developmental assessment for kindergarten readiness and that's what we tended to use in the schools that I've worked with and uh, among the things that they noted is that you know a child that's very bright and catches on quick often doesn't develop attention span the way other kids who aren't and so for the bright kid you got to help him develop patience and attention span and the and the other kid may have to <coughs> work on uh, uh, understanding concepts uh, more or something like that. So you've got very different kinds of challenges from from early kids and um, uh, is, is the gazelle or something like it something that that we're looking at in terms of developing a kindergarten it, readiness model? It looks at seven domains. Yes. So yes. it's looking across that's the that's the model we're looking at um, because you're right at kindergarten this is not a paper and pencil test. This is looking across a variety of aspects. So that's, that's what we're going to be using. Okay. Because that, that seems much more, on the other hand, you can't quantify it. Uh, you can't turn it into a number to compare kids instantly. No, but you can identify areas that need boosting. Yeah. 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 
And that, that seems much yes. more appropriate way yeah. to approach it to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, then Craig, then Lupac. Well, I wanted to respond to something that Dan said, I mean, you said. We have had some early intervention programs that we supported that the Blisi program was very effective. And we, that was supposed to be pilot programs and special grants. How do we bring that to scale? That's, that's the kind of thing we need, early, the early intervention, really. Say, that's, that also, the statistics show that it saves, it saves money, it saves suspensions, it saves expulsions, it saves, I mean, it, it's just so sensible. I think targeting funding, advocacy for targeted funding is going to be more effective than just more funding. I think that's what it was proven with early childhood. I think that's what can happen with the points you're bringing up, Kath, and we can make a case and get a broad audience to support that case, we'll get funding for it. Mm -hmm. If we just say more funding, we can go out and say it as much as we want and get applause yeah, and all the rest. We have to use what we've got, what we know, what works, mm -hmm. and expand it. Yeah, right, exa exactly. So yeah. And, and in principle, I agree. Yes. I agree. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I mean, I just think we're in a culture now where that's going to be what will be pay off. We can make a case, right. targeted funding. I think we've, we've got a stream now that started with early childhood. It'll be much bigger in five years. The $65 million will look like a drop in the bucket. Right. But it's targeting. It's not just the general all over because it just doesn't work. I mean, uh, you'd like to have most people do what most of us sitting at this table would do, which is willing to pay more taxes in order to get, the, you know, to get more services yeah. for our kids. But given with the reality, the targeted is working. Yeah, well, I, want, I wanted to make a comment, too, that when if this goes to the legislature, and they see that uh, $9.4 billion is invested, they say, what do they need more money for? They've got all that money. I don't think they have any idea that Medicaid has anything to do with early childhood. Mm -hmm. We have not thought about it that way either. So if it's Medicaid and state aid, what else? Is it federal, federal funding? And There's 89 different s services um, that are funded with federal and state dollars for early childhood. So that, I mean, it's education services, it's human services, it's um, um, community health services, even um, the tax credits. <coughs> are included in there. So, I mean, it's all of the funding across all of, it's, um, it, in fact, it's uh, 89 different programs and there's um, a write-up on each of the programs, the amount of money that's in each of them and the number of people served and all of that. So, it's, it's an interesting document, but that's, there's 89 services. Thank you, Craig, and then Lupe. Hmm? I'm worried, but when they see this figure, they're going to rebel. So we don't need any more. Have to explain it to them. Craig, you can do that. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, enough about me, Kathy. Uh, as Eileen, Kathy, Mike, John, Susan can vouch for. I've never been mute for 15 minutes, let alone two <laughs> hours. <laughs> we thought it was dry. Honeymoon's over. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, I echo everything you said, and you did it with more passion than I could do, uh, more eloquence. Uh, totally with you. Uh, the governor is, is just elated that the legislature appropriated $40 million to fill more slots and with the promise of another 25 million if we earn our keep. Mm -hmm. So uh, on behalf of the governor, uh, both he and I are going to keep an eagle eye on how we're doing in terms of filling these slots mm -hmm. and what kind of incentives we're providing and what the barriers are. Mm -hmm. But it is vitally important to the advancement of early childhood that we spend wisely, to Richard's point, 65 million. But first, we've got to fill those place slots. So any way we can help you, call on us. We already have requests from the ISDs that exceed the $65 yes. million. Yes. Love it. <laughs> Great. There are 29,000 kids out there plus who 
need the GSRP service. Thank you. Both good points. Lupe, Thanks. please. What was that number? 29,000. Lupe, Ford. Okay. Um, of course, early childhood is one of my passions, and, and this is a very, very important discussion. But I would like um, uh, Superintendent Flanagan to tell us how many items in this agenda or how many reports are still pending. We have spent uh, 43 minutes in this issue, in this uh, report. So how many more reports do we have? And we, is, is our goal to terminate the meeting at 3, to finish the meeting at 3, or are we going to be able to stay longer? Uh, and how much time do we want to allot to each item? I want to know how many items we still have to discuss, how many more reports, uh, because if we allot uh, 40, uh, 43 minutes to each one, we're going to be here a long, long time. So I, and, and I know all of these items on this agenda are very important. I know that there's people in the audience waiting for their item to be discussed. Uh, so I know that all of these items are very, very important. So I want to know how many more items, uh, how many more reports we have so we can allot the time that we have uh, to the uh, items that are going to be discussed today. You know, I, I, a few of you have uh, talked to me offline about maybe my role being a little more aggressive uh, on time. I, I, what I would choose to do, and if this is okay, is wait till agenda planning. And what's been on my mind since two of you talked to me was that maybe there we set goals for the time of each item and try to stick to them. I need some license because I want to be respectful of, of views here. But I also understand your point, and there have been times, I'm not judging this, but there's been times where we have shortchanged other items in order to accommodate. So if, if, if that would work for today, because you're, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it would be tough to get this done by 3 o'clock now. Well, I, I, mean, I, th I thought this meeting we were assuming we were going to probably go to 4. So given the, the buildup, I mean, when we looked at the agenda planning numbers. Well, is it, let's ask that. I mean, are we going to 4? Then then I would, re would pull back my remark. If we're going to 4, I okay. think we're well, in well, I think that has to be clarified. Are we going to go to 4? And I want to know how many items, how many reports we still have uh, so we can get all the items taken care of because all of the items are important to someone. Yeah. yeah. I, looking at it, I think <coughs> we are going to be pressed for time. Yeah. So are we okay till 4 mm -hmm. today? Even if we go to Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and I'll try to okay. do a little better job the next uh, couple hours. Yeah. But uh, bear with me, okay? <laughs> but I, I understand your point, and I think it's well taken. I think we do have folks that, because I've not just heard from two board members, I've heard from folks in the audience at times, and I, it, it probably is on me more than anyone else, but I could use help at the agenda planning to try to estimate time, and then, and then I'll try to keep us rolling towards that. Okay, so, so then, Mike, okay, I, I just want clarification because I have made appointments after I was going to leave here at 3 mm -hmm. in Grand Rapids. So if we're going to stay at 4, then I'll cancel my appointments, then everybody's going to stay till 4, and we're going to finish this agenda because all of these items are important. Am I right? Please, Cassandra, you're ready to? Uh, you know, I, I just think that we should, we, we say we're going to leave try for 3 o'clock and I think that we should try to maintain that if we possibly can because like Lupe, you know, other people have, I have another board meeting, believe it or not, <laughs> tonight <laughs> that I have to go to as well. So um, I, I agree with Lupe. I think it's important for us to try to stick as close as we can to that. Well, let's, let's uh, I think where we maybe uh, collectively drop the ball a little bit is if we make a determination or a suggestion that it go past three, I think we'd have to be clearer about that probably. I, it might, I think John's right. We, we kind of in our mind said, hey, this is probably going to go longer than three. But if you will, I might just say on behalf of those of us that work here that it, it is hard to estimate what the discussion would be. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's healthy. I think these are all robust, excellent discussions. But let me uh, do my best to try to get us to three. And I can amend some of what I'm going to do, and I'll 
and I'll ask our guys to do some of the same um, in this upcoming, and if that's okay for now. And then I do think we need a, a discussion at agenda planning too, and maybe set some targets on time. Thank you for that, though. Thank you. Um, I've lost track now. Who's who's up? Are we good? Next time. Dan, please. I will uh, try and um, shorten my list. Uh, quick example, Susan, around that alignment stuff. Um, more concerned about alignment outside of the department than within. Uh, so the wonderful graphic at the end of the report about um, kind of making sure that we fill head start slots first before uh, grade start slots. Um, I don't know how to build that into the grants that go to support grade start programs, but something like, you know, you've got to return something like some some it'd be. Off the top of my head, crazy provocative idea, what would make sense is some kind of a financial incentive for, like, you get extra Great Start dollars if all of your Head Start slots are filled, but not until all of your Head Start slots are filled, right? So that if there are empty Head Start slots, you're not, you're not, you know, so that there's no incentive for um, GSRP providers to, um, to be filling slots before Head Start gets well, filled. Or one of the criteria for a GSRP is that the first question is, is this child eligible for Head Start? And then the child is referred to Head Start. Could come back to GSRP if all of the Head Start was, right. all slots were filled. Right. As well as part of um, the strategy with this expansion is to blend the funding of the GSRP and the Head Start so that it could be a full day program. Right. And that's the best of both worlds. Right. And so, so that's the, that's right. some of the, uh, there is some alignment in yeah, that. I know we're working on that yeah. stuff. I mean, I yeah. see it in Detroit, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that we could probably do more. And it's mm -hmm. not, I mean, it's not like OGS is responsible for this, having not been in existence for all that long. But I think we've just got to think really creatively about it. I mean, how do you actually enroll? You should be able to enroll in Head Start going to the GSRP. Mm -hmm. Like, you should just be able to fill out the Head Start form, right? And so on and so forth. There's um, joint enrollment. I'll skip that one. Um, Oh, just a quick question, uh, so last two points. Quick question, uh, and you can answer this one at the end. Um, do you have a thought about requiring participation in, in um, Great Start to Quality? Uh, right now, I don't, is, it, is it mandatory? No, for, it's voluntary. Right, so why not make it mandatory for folks um, who are getting state money? So just, that's the question. Does that make sense? What do you mean? No, I don't understand what you mean. They would only get state money if they were enrolled in the GSRP. No, no, uh, not GSRP. Great Start to Quality. The oh, Great Start to Quality. Yeah, I'm sorry. So making that mandatory, so the participation um, in that is mandatory. We're it it is um, required that um, in order to get GSRP money, they have to be at least a three star. So that's Great Start to Quality rating. So it's already hooked. What about so not? So outside of GSRP, um, so, but in order to get the state reimbursement for an educator, right? Why not make that contingent upon participation in Great Start to Quality? Like, why not tie all state funding? Like, you you can't get it for your center unless you're doing Great Start to Quality, and that way we can score you, so on and so forth, and parents can get access to that information about what a quality program is or isn't. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you don't want to say more about that? Well, that's all part of what I call the child care subsidy, the rethinking child care mm -hmm. subsidy is actually figuring out whether it should also be tiered reimbursement or different pieces like that where you're tying it to the quality, but also simultaneously allowing parent choice. So, I mean, that's... All right, you're yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. Last thought, and that is, I'm sorry for taking all the time, folks, um, but the last thought is page 22. I'm really struck by this comment. So parents said, um, or the report says, um, parents were asked to consider what they would want to know or see graded if a report card existed to keep track of progress on early childhood in Michigan. Quote, by far the first and most common response was that they would want to know about the availability of or access to high quality early, early childhood learning programs. Um, so that's a huge, that's, that is like, we can build quality right. and if we don't provide parents with access right. to the information that right. allows them to choose the higher quality program, right. it's all for right. naught. Um, and so I just really want to lift that up for everybody here. It's critically important that we figure out 
in a way that we haven't yet really had to with K-12 because you don't have, it's not just like widely choice, right? Um, in the early childhood space, that's, that's really a muscle that we're going to have to build that <laughs> we've not had to build yet. One of the comments from one of the parents was there should be a quality rating system for all early childhood services, not just the early learning services. Mm. That parents should be able to see what is the quality of health services also and on the line. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you guys. Great job. Appreciate all your efforts on that. And folks in the audience, I can't thank you enough. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are without your work and help. The next item should be short. It's discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. Okay. And we're going to move on to the regular meeting and call to order. The time is now 11.30 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of June 18, 2013 is called to order. The first item is the approval of minutes of regular committee meeting of the whole of May 14th. I move approval of the minutes for May 14th. Support. Oh, John supported by Dan. Yes, Kathleen. I thought we should have, I wanted to add something to the meeting where we talked, when we, what's written about the uh, meeting with the appropriations rumors. All it says is that we, uh, that we had discussion. And we'll we'll talk about that. I'll talk about that. I spoke to, uh, I spoke to Marilyn about putting this in the minutes, that we had a big, big discussion. There was discussion and agreement that we would like to form a joint task force mm -hmm. to deal with school finance. And I think that's important enough to put in the minutes, because that's the official record of our meeting. And I, I've given the wording to Marilyn, mm -hmm. so uh, I, support but I wanted to bring it up here and <clears throat> make sure we included it in the minutes. Okay. I agree. <clears throat> I got it. So I, do I have to move to... Uh, <coughs> amend the minutes to include that? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll move, move to, to um, the approve the minutes as amended with Kathleen's okay. language noting the Appropriations Committee discussion and meeting process. Support. Supported by Dan. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. Approval of minutes of the State Board of Ed meeting of May 21. Move Supports. approval. Moved by John. Supported, Supported by Cassandra. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. Motion passes. President's report. John. I don't know where Craig ran off to. I really wanted to uh, start by um, thanking him and, and appreciating his uh, participation uh, and joining us and say a few things about the relationship you know, with the governor's office uh, and how we can uh, uh, renew the kind of collaboration that got a little uh, strained. But let me come back to that. Um, so. Uh, just a couple things I just wanted to discuss briefly, including to inform the discussion. I'll have a little bit more this afternoon on how we move forward to try to lead the discussion of school organization and finance that we need to make. Um, you know, this time last year, we did have in front of us, you know, a plan much needed for how we would uh, organize and get some help in uh, facilitating the attention to how do we organize our schools, how do we finance them, given all the changes and all the the, the needs uh, that are out there. Um, you know, frankly, I think that effort definitely got um, uh, distracted by, subsumed in the emerging effort that the governor's folks initiated with the Oxford Foundation, which, while at the beginning was uh, supposed to be a relatively modest examination of changes in school code and new financing ideas. It clearly took on a, a sort of life on its own and we had to um, both inform, which I think we attempted to do, but also then react to uh, many of the ideas that unfortunately you know, came rather fast and furious, including in the legislative form and lame duck and then in, in ideas for school finance. So. Uh, and, and I, I think all of that has, has in some sense not exactly run its course, but it, it didn't all come forward as perfectly and as helpfully as it could. So I do think it's really important now that we you know, reset and uh, help participate in and lead the discussion about, okay, how do we affirmatively uh, examine how schools are organized and funded for, for success, for quality education. And you know, we've, we've seen so much recently about the schools in distress and uh, I, you know, frankly, many of them uh, are in uh, 
uh, a mess of their own making where they didn't make good decisions, uh, and including folks probably like Buena Vista. Uh, and uh, certainly there are real places where consolidation and other uh, important big changes are needed, and, and we need to figure out how to help that along together. But you know, as I've observed, my own school district of Ann Arbor, which is reasonably well managed, uh, is cutting back things that are more bone-like, uh, like teachers and arts and music and charging for after school and uh, affecting the quality of places that including my own kids have benefited from, like Community High, one of the great high schools. And my other daughter is going to Ypsilanti. There you have a, a needed and helped by Mike and everybody, consolidation underway. But it's so, it's putting so much stress and uncertainty on those who are trying to deliver education. My daughter's innovative new high school that Ipsy started to try to uh, improve its offerings. To its credit, several teachers who are key to the program felt they had to find a, a more secure post because they didn't know if they'd have jobs. And so the whole stress on our system has been, um, is being felt. And I think that's why we do need to do our job uh, as schools do their job to provide some guidance and an affirmative vision and plan for how we organize and finance education and we'll talk more this afternoon about how we might move forward with that. But I also think the second point is I really think it has to include uh, and uh, deal with um, a thoughtful attention to how we, what is our school choice and charter strategy in this state. Uh, and I was struck by you know, the Ed Trust report that came out not too long ago with a roadmap for Michigan. And even if you can um, debate their analysis or conclusions, you know, this, this quote, while leading states were developing a more comprehensive approach to education, Michigan's primary strategy has been to expand school choice by allowing charter and virtual schools to proliferate regardless of quality. Michigan has largely counted on choices dramatic to dramatically raise achievement, and that strategy hasn't paid off. It's what hit me about that, that certainly is not the strategy that we all were formally advancing. It may have become part of a de facto strategy. And for those of us who really want to figure out how we uh, do choice and charters well, how, what's our quality choice and charter strategy, not one that may be uh, diminishing uh, education for its own students, but also for other students as, as uh, uh, resources and other things are compromised. So I think that has to be a part of it. And I really think as we do this work together, I'm calling on, I want to ask uh, the authorizing community, the quality charter advocacy organizations like Ed Trust to help us and step up with their recommendations, thoughtful, as we try to make ours on how do we do better oversight transparency but a quality choice charter regime. What does that look like? Because I think it's an important element of whatever we, we come out with. Um, there are important legislative pieces moving that I hope we'll make sure we talk about this afternoon. Thank Cassandra and the team that worked on some of those recommendations. I just want to come back to Craig because I was going to say to Craig if he was here, um, it's really helpful to have someone who I think we all and I certainly have a relationship with of, of, of trust and candor. And uh, we've had that, uh, frankly, with the governor and Bill Rustum and Greg Tedder even, though I think it did break down a bit last fall as we tried to first inform and then catch up with what was not, and react to then, uh, a, as transparent and helpful a process of interaction with whatever the governor's strategy making was. So I am eager, and I've told Craig and others, you know, to press the reset button. And I would, I would recommend to us that we do what we've done in the past, which is include Craig as the education advisor in our uh, communications as a total board in our agenda planning. Uh, and I know we can trust that that kind of uh, communication will be uh, helpful and so that we're trying to pull ORs together or find the common ground where we can pull ORs together. So that's, uh, that's what I would certainly hope we might uh, take the opportunity to do with uh, just this uh, um, change in, in the personnel. That's a great point, John. I do think resets are a great way to think about it. And um, I think we do have an opportunity, a great opportunity with Craig in that spot. So thank you. I'm going to reduce my report to just what we promised. I won't make these other comments. I'll probably do it in writing or some other way. But I it would, would the, Vanessa, are you leading this? So you're coming down. And I know, I think Mike Flaminio and Kaylee Cornfield. And this was promised where I won't ask for any discussion on this. It's under my item, report of the superintendent and in the interest of time. But I, we wanted to give you a brief update 
on how this kind of discussion slash eventual uh, recommendations related to technology, the classroom, blah, 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 and what we showed you last time a little bit on the, on the so-called Facebook project. These two guys, by the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but just starting the last few weeks, we're given as, quote, department heads some coins that you can give to folks that are doing something above and beyond, kind of like the military does. And the first ones I gave out as a surprise uh, to Kaylee and Mike because this is over and above. This is with everything else they have to do. And they're in a world that I only barely understand. We have a little family Facebook that I go on cautiously because I'm not sure exactly where it's going. But uh, this has really been outstanding. It's really gotten a lot of participation. And Vanessa, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to um, explain, give you guys an update on what's happened in the last month. Um, a lot has actually happened in the last month on our EdTech work group. So just to remind you, um, this is what our page looks like. You see we're up to 764 likes, and we've had a lot of participation on the page and the survey. Quick update on progress to date. We did receive almost 1,000 survey responses, 989, and that's a pretty phenomenal response rate. And we have, again, the 764 likes. We've completed an initial analysis of the responses. And I want to um, highlight this for a minute to say we had a team of about 30 readers across MDE who, outside of their regular jobs, volunteered to be part of this initiative to read the responses and quickly because we know the field is very interested in, in hearing um, our reactions to this information. <coughs> so I want to thank that group. Um, they really devoted their time and Mike made a great interactive tool for them to do the reading. So it was a nice chance for our staff to hear the voices of people out in the field directly. You know, sometimes everything's filtered. Um, this was a chance to read survey responses. And so that's what we're going to show you today, just a, a couple things um, about our participation and then about the responses. So who participated in our survey? So this is the survey specifically, not the Facebook page in, in its entirety. Um, you can read the graph. but highlighting that secondary teachers and other K-12 education staff are our most frequent responders. But we did get decent participation from parents, um, from administrators. We would like to, as we move forward, think about how we get some of those bars at the bottom larger. You got one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we are, are excited to see kind of representation across all of the voices. Any legislator maybe? So this <laughs> graph represents our Facebook page content reach. So this is completely separate from the survey. We're just talking about the Facebook page. The orange inner circle um, represents the average on a daily basis of people who have liked our page, who are um, seeing our content, who are viewing our content. So 224 people who have liked our page on average are seeing our content every day. The circle, the green, dark green circle, just outside of that is the average, our average daily viral reach. So this is really cool. 592 people on average every day who have not liked our page are seeing our page content because their friends on Facebook are liking, commenting, or sharing our page content. So that's a really powerful number. Altogether, we have a total of about 816 people every day seeing our content. So both of those numbers combined. The blue outer circle represents the total friends of friends of everyone who has liked our page. So that is, that's our opportunity. We have an opportunity to reach, as of today, we have an opportunity to reach 216,631 people on Facebook. So we hope to continue expanding that viral reach and, and broadening our, our audience. And keep in mind that the, strat or the survey was only one part of the strategy. The, the large-scale discussion and the strategy going forward is really about the Facebook page and its, its potential reach. So we are excited to have you know, 200,000 possible people to be engaged in this discussion, and this is one of the main reasons we went with this venue, to have it be much broader than it would be if we called a, a meeting together with all the people we could think of who we think like to talk about educational technology. Um, so as we move forward, leveraging that outer circle is going to be a big part of our, our work, as well as the inner, the inner circles are important too, but you know, getting, getting into that outer circle as well. So turning back to the survey briefly to kind of look at um, what we found in our very first pass through, these were the, just a reminder, these were the questions that we asked. Um, so what does that tech mean to you? How do you see it being used currently? And then this more, couple more visionary statements that we ask people to respond to. How should it be used in the next 10 years? 
and what's the ultimate role or goal. This is a word cloud. Uh, I think we showed one of these before, maybe not, maybe we didn't. This is across all of the responses, and this is the frequency of words. So the bigger the word, the more frequent it was used in, in the responses. And I think, although this isn't you know, a complete analysis, our main takeaway from this cloud is the prevalence of students and learning and education. That that's what people were talking about in terms of educational technology, about students and how we use it for learning and education. And then you can see teachers and classrooms come up and school um, using is obviously down there, but as in using technology for students and learning and, and education. Um, so this kind of tells us that this is what people were talking about the most, what they're most concerned with. And it, seeing students right in the center and very large is, is always encouraging because that's what really this is about at the end of the day. Again, looking now across the surveys, when our readers went through, we asked them to categorize the responses into um, 12 main categories. And so this is how frequent, how often a response referred to one of these categories. And you can see at the top bar, um, inspiring and supporting students was the most common response. So that people were talking about ed tech to inspire and support students. And the second most common was to inspire and support teachers. Um, you see fear concern is the third one. People were concerned about how <coughs> do we have educational technology be for positive uses and inspiration <coughs> and support of students and not, not be um, negative. But I think there were a lot of quality discussions, you know, just people saying we need to think about this and, and be careful with it. So I think that's a good caution. And then you can see how um, individualized instruction is also a frequent use as well, which aligns with one of the MDE goals around um, personalized learning. We just pulled one question to kind of show you some of the responses. Um, this is that visionary question. What do you see as the ultimate role or goal of ed tech, educational technology? Where are we going? And you see that the inspire, support, students bar actually grew. More people, so people are kind of saying the ultimate role, the ultimate goal is to inspire and support students. Uh, individual instruction moved up that we need to kind of be thinking about how we use it as one of the tools in a toolkit to do this personalized learning that, that we know needs to happen for students. Um, and then distance learning and teacher prep teacher preparation and professional development made it on to this response. So um, respondents saying ultimately we should be using this in new and different ways for those purposes. I think some of Bobby Joe's um, presentations have showed us some, um, some directions in that. So our major takeaways out of this survey were again the importance of this to support students and teachers as a tool in a toolkit that does this work. Um, the educational technology has power as, as part of a strategy. And then really that it can be what we can do to, to personalize learning for students. It, one of the things we can do to personalize learning for students. So our next steps, we're going to get back into the data, do additional analyses. We look forward to um, some of the, the Facebook responders are saying, you know, we want to be engaged in the discussion again on an, analyzing the results. So we look forward to, to continuing to work with groups um, and people in, again, new and different ways. Um, so continuing to leverage virtual connections. Um, we have started to present the results back on Facebook, so hopefully you've all liked the page and you're following and you're seeing the graphs and the charts um, that present more detail. And then we do want to, in the next few months, start to take these responses to pick some an area or some areas of focus that we can really start to um, hone in on and think about what do we do in this area? What, how, what, how do we take their responses? What are our action steps? What are our best practices? What can we do to become actionable from this information? So the initial goal was to lead a discussion, but again, given the department goals around personalized learning and career and college readiness and teachers and students and everything, we need to um, take the discussion and leverage it to become intentional in our work and to really put some of these tools in teacher, tool, or teacher, parent, and student toolboxes. So that's where our work is going. Great. Thank you. And we'll have more to come. And I'm going to skip the rest of my report for now in the interest of time. We, we can, um, lunch is here, so we could determine a time you'd like to come back. Um, Deborah Ball, the dean, will be here, I think, at 1.30. We're going to have public participation. We can, if, depending on how long that is, we could go to some other items before Deborah Ball. So what would your wishes could we, be could on we come March? back at 12.30 and 12 get into some other items, and then we try to stay on track? Okay. Sound good? 12.30.
got uh, corn dogs in the back there. <laughs> Bear food. Please join us, Greg. We're in the back here, you'll see. And do I have to do this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, Check to see what I did. Kyle, you know the one that did the video for you? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know you got it. So anyway, let me tell you something. Okay. Yeah, Kyle, is the, the first one that did your... Yeah, she's still on the end, the second one. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm going to hide this one. Let's go get something to lunch. Was it two principal that came in? Yeah, they got stuck in the Oh, so they missed it all. Oh, yeah. They, yeah, it, it was bad. It was real bad. Um, yeah, hold or on. Can you get your camera? Yeah, yeah, I was just trying to. Oh. Years. I'm trying to access my <laughs> <laughs> I really? to hold it together. Uh, you did. I heard it one point. There she goes. No, I was yeah. trying to hold it together. Oh. Well, I got my calendar. Uh, August 20. Oh, my, was my parents' wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah. At some point. Oh, yeah. It'll be like a Tuesday, I think. Good job. Oh, this is you, and, and I, I got the Did you get this one? That one I didn't get. Oh, I gotta get to this one.